Hello. Today we're going to look at the reason for quantum mechanics. I say that because I think a number of physics students think that the person who invented quantum mechanics did so just to annoy physics students down through the ages. In fact, quantum mechanics was developed to solve a very particular problem, and that's what we're going to cover today. We need to go back to the time of the ancient Greek philosophers. There was, among other debates, a debate about the nature of matter. The question was, if you took a piece of material, it could be anything, but let's imagine a wooden plank, and you cut it into two, and then you took one half and cut it into two again, and then you took one of those halves and cut that into two again, could you continue doing that forever? Now, there were two schools of opinion. Firstly, there was a Greek philosopher called Democritus. He thought that you couldn't continue to do that. He reckoned that you must get to a point where you could no longer cut things in half. Forget for a moment that you would quickly find a practical problem with doing that. Philosophers do not worry about practical problems. They're more concerned about whether things can happen in principle. Well, in principle, Democritus thought that you would get to a point that would be indivisible. And he called that atomos, which I think means indivisible in Greek. It's the word from which we get atom. Now, there was another famous philosopher called Aristotle, and he took completely the opposite view. He thought there was no reason why you shouldn't be able to divide something forever, because if you keep cutting things in half, you never get down to zero. You only get half what you had before. And for nearly 2,000 years, Aristotle's view held sway. There was no basic building block called an atom. But as we started to get into the 1800s, the situation started to change, largely due to the work of famous chemists. It was already known, for example, that there were things called elements. Things like gold and silver and lead and copper had long been known. And it was also known that you couldn't ever make these elements. If you took something like iron ore, you could produce iron. But you couldn't produce iron from something that didn't contain iron in the first place. The alchemists down through the ages were looking for the solution of how to make gold out of base metal, but no one could do it. So there seemed to be something special about each element. Each element seemed to be different from each other element, and you couldn't make one from the other. It was John Dalton in 1803 who began to piece the pieces together. He noticed that you could take elements and form them together to make compounds. And so he came to these conclusions. Firstly, he said that matter was composed of atoms. He didn't know what the atom was. Secondly, all atoms of a given element are identical. Thirdly, atoms of different elements have different weights. They're called atomic weights. And atoms combine in simple ratios to form compounds. And so the idea was born that at the heart of every element, there's a thing called an atom. It was rather like a very, very tiny billiard ball, and it was indivisible. No one knew what the atom was, but that's as far as it had got. Now, it was J.J. Thompson, a physicist in 1897, who showed that that wasn't entirely right. He was doing an experiment which consisted of taking a glass tube, evacuating it, putting a small amount of hydrogen in it, and then passing a very high current through the gas. He introduced a new original bit. He put electric plates on either side of this current. When the current passed through the gas, it made the gas glow. When J.J. Thompson switched on the electric plates, such that one was positive and the other was negative, he noticed that something in the glowing material seemed to veer off towards the positive plate. He knew enough to know that like charges repel and unlike charges attract, 
So pluses and pluses repel, but pluses are attracted to minus. So if you've got something that's attracted to the positive plate, it must be negatively charged. He knew that what he'd got in the tube was hydrogen, and he knew that hydrogen was electrically neutral. So what had he made that was negatively charged? He assumed that he must have split up whatever the basic atoms of hydrogen were, and that a negative bit had come out. But if there was a negative bit, there would also have to be a positive bit in order for the two bits to join together and be electrically neutral. And if there was a positive bit, then surely that should veer towards the negatively charged electric plate. But initially, he couldn't see anything doing that. Then he looked more carefully, and he noticed that although the negatively charged bit was veering quite substantially towards the positively charged plate, the positively charged bit was barely moving at all towards the negatively charged plate. And he concluded from that that whatever the positively charged bit was, it was much, much heavier than the negatively charged bit. Because the heavier something is, the harder it is to veer it off course. And so J.J. Thompson concluded that the atom, which had been thought of as being indivisible, was in fact made up of two parts, a positively charged bit and a negatively charged bit. And the best model that they could come up with that was the plum pudding model. And for those of you who don't know what a plum pudding is, you can equally consider that as a current bun model. A current bun, of course, consists of the main dough, and it's got currents splattered about inside the bun. And so it was thought that this was the model of an atom. The positively charged bit was the dough. The negatively charged bit were the negatively charged, what we now call electrons, sitting in the middle, rather like currents do in a current bun. The story moves on now to the discovery of radioactivity. This was discovered by Becquerel, but there were other people working on it at the time. And the thing about radioactive substances was that they were seen to emit rays. And there were three types of rays that were emitted by radioactive material. Because no one knew what they were, they were given the names of the first three letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, and gamma. And what was the difference between these rays? Well, if you put them in the presence of an electric field by putting two electric plates on either side, one charged positively and one charged negatively, then alpha rays would be attracted towards the negative plate, which would mean that they were positively charged. Beta rays were attracted to the positive plate, which meant that they were negatively charged. And gamma rays weren't deflected at all, which meant they weren't charged. This radiation, or these rays, were generally found when atoms decayed. 